So this is us. <coughs> the service desk, we are always smiling. We are always giving you a sense of that everything is effortless, or at least that's what we're supposed to do. But in the re reality, the service desk is a really interesting attack vector because it's often a junior staff, which is low in hierarchy, low in salary, obviously. And uh, we always need to, although we may be stressed out a lot, we will still need to be service-minded and look like this all the time. So there are not, not all of the attack vectors against the um, service desk are social engineering, but many of them are. And that's also a problem because really, how do you protect yourself with security against social engineering? It's kind of hard to measure your res the resilience of the organization. Uh, when it comes to technical things, you can measure it. And you can know that if you're doing uh, doing one attack at one time, it's, it's probably going to be the same result the next time. But you can do uh, social engineering attacks 100 times and get 100 different results. And also, it's a different skill set to do social engineering than to do technical uh, hacking. Uh, and also, as a, if, if you're doing like 6 million LinkedIn uh, password cracking things. You're disconnected from that user. But the user that you are social engineering, you are talking to. And so most of us don't want to do this because we have some sense of not being dicks. So there are many social hur hurdles before you start doing it. So then you say that you, d you don't want to distrust the people around you. Uh, because the, of the obvious implications of starting to distrust people around you. Well, so I'm going to go through uh, some of the service desk um, attack vectors here. Obviously, I'm not going to do a full... Um, I'm not going to talk about absolutely everything. I'm also not an academic anymore, so I don't have to have some kind of method except for being smart, <laughs> I don't know. Um, also, I need to do this disclaimer in the beginning. I myself have worked in service desk, but I am in no way implying that any of the following vulnerabilities are present nor exploitable in those companies that I have been working with. Uh, you, I also want you to note that I wanted to do service desk because of a keen interest in user security and passwords. Uh, basically because in most risk assessments, this will always be the low-hanging fruit. And if we can do something about this, something else will be the low-hanging fruit, and we will, do, we will have done a lot for the whole organization. So let's start with the absolutely most unsexy part of this, uh, procedures. So, firstly, procedures need to exist. Secondly, they need to be possible to follow. And thirdly, they need to be followed. And, okay, this is, this is dead simple in theory, but it's so hard in practice. So there is so much that you can do. I want to take an example from Russia that I got from some other friends in here. Um, that uh, they outlawed LinkedIn. Uh, so obviously now there's a procedure that exists. It's forbidden to use LinkedIn. Uh, this is not possible to follow. And it's also not, no one is interested in following it. So everybody side channels it and do their own ad hoc procedures. And this is, this is prominent everywhere. Uh, another very obvious thing is privilege. <laughs> Everyone in here should know that it's bad to give everybody 
the domain admin access or an administrator access or anything. Um, and why do, would you do that? Well, because you don't have procedures. Like you can stress test your organization by looking at how it works in July. If uh, your service desk will have a very big problem in July, they are always going to have a problem. Um, their organization doesn't work. And the reason that you need domain admin for everyone in an organization or everyone in a service desk is that you don't have the procedures to make it work smoothly with a least privileged approach. Passwords, that's why we all are here. I like to be this uh, expert cat. I think, I think this is an expert cat. Um, so my user calls in <coughs> and wants to change the password. So how do I do to authenticate that person? Well, uh, I would like to trust everyone. And be, for, for a social engineer to, to want to um, attack me, they must know that who is the support. And if it's uh, outsourced, you, it, it's not all, always apparent. But you know, scanning an enumeration, open source intelligence, it's not that hard. Uh, so what many organizations do is that they accept that if uh, the request comes from um, the same person that wants the reset, that has access to their own mail account, uh, they grant access. Or if the uh, phone number is regist registered in, for example, the Active Directory, uh, you will grant access. And if, uh, if you can't authenticate, in best case, you will have to say, I'm very sorry. Uh, can you please have someone who's authorized to order to do this, Some, for example, your boss? And in the best of worlds, they will understand that passwords is actually a very important asset and that you shouldn't give this out. Uh, so hopefully, the user actually acknowledges this and doesn't go to your boss and complain and have you fired. But you never know, you know, uh, because you need, really need to be service minded. At the same time as you're denying someone the access. So the next problem is this thing that you have uh, the uh, three month um, password change. So my user say, hey, I want to change my password. Can you ch please change from summer 2016 onto autumn 2016? And then I really can't say no. Because again, then I will not seem very effortless. So uh, what I have been trying to do is instead of asking them, do you want me to change your password, uh, to choose your password, or do you want to cho choose your password, I, every, whenever I can, I choose it for them, which is great if they ask for it in, in uh, uh, mail. If they do it uh, via telephone, they often, more often ask to have a special password. Um, so I have been using a, a Diceware version. And obviously, if I would give them a real secure Diceware password, one of those that cannot be cracked in 3,500 years, blah, 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 uh, I will also get complaints. So they absolutely do not want a 30 character password. So what I have been trying to do is some kind of, of compromise with uh, three random words made from a, a list online. And I give it to them. And I have actually not received any complaints about this, which is great. Um, this um, shorter kind of diceware will cost in the realms of $1,000 to crack. 
which is also great. Because then I, for that particular user, I have now um, written <coughs> the, the security for the password and something else will be a problem instead. But then how do I do to make my colleagues interested in what I'm doing? Because I know more about passwords than all of them do, or most of them do. And I have some ideas about how can we do this to, to implement this in the whole organization. Because if you have those three month uh, um, expiration rules, you will have a, uh, uh, a rolling out of good passwords that will take three months. Great. But then I have to make everybody else in the service desk to also think that this is a good idea. And thus far, I have been more successful with users than with other systems. So they keep on using the same. Like, there's really no hurdle. Like using my diceware, on, online diceware word list, or using another generator that is not secure. There is no difference in effort in doing this. But still, it's really hard to make someone else do it. And obviously, for some reason, it's harder to make people who, who would be, would know better, to do better. <coughs> and so most of these password resets <laughs> are made via email. And so I really, 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 really hope that your uh, service desk has uh, an encrypted, uh, an, a mail server that accepts encryption and that the receiving part will also have it. Otherwise, you can grab for all the passwords that has been issued for the last couple of days or a couple of months or whatever. And this is really the hardest part here. You, how do you protect yourself from outsiders, insiders? You can go through their criminal records. But in almost all cases in a democracy, even if someone is fishy but, not, um, but doesn't have a criminal record, it, you know, it won't show, show up that someone is, is a gray hat. It will only show up um, that something has happened if, if they are doing, like, I don't know, assault when they are drunk. And you have the non disclosure agreement. But frankly, when have you heard of a non disclosure agreement uh, violation case in the past years? It doesn't happen very often. Uh, so that's maybe a deterring factor, but it's not actually something. Mm. Like, <coughs> it, it would be d deterrent if people are like, like their organization uh, or feel some kind of purpose and some kind of belonging, but otherwise it won't really help you. And this is an issue all over. Like You can't really build a system that is secure against insiders. One of the biggest problems, you know, problems, problem exists between chair and keyboard, the layer eight problem. Um, this is a really bad way of thinking about your users. Because if your user don't understand what you're saying, you are saying it in the wrong way. It's your fault. It's not the user's fault. Like, we really need to take this as a real issue. We, we have to address this in, in a reasonable manner, and it's really starting to do that. Um, I, I love, for example, that th the first really secure app that has smileys in it, it's Signal. They have like anonymized GIFs. You can even send, send dirty pics to people and they will disappear in, in Signal. Um, I really love what the Open Whisper system is doing 
uh, when it comes to usability in their super secure products. Because they are designing a super secure product that people would possibly want. Instead of uh, saying that, hey, if you don't, um, don't you care about your privacy most, most of all? Because most people don't. So when it comes to users, there's also the big problem about the awareness training and how it's been being done. I have not only been working as a service desk person, I have also been working as an uh, ISO 27000 consultant. And there is a clause there about security awareness training being done annually. And in most cases that I have seen, this is implemented with, well, there is an online training like, I don't know what about it, but it takes 20 minutes and afterwards you can print out a certificate that you have done it and that's it. Although this is the user's is the most obvious attack vector, this is something that not even uh, the IOS, ISO people really care about or the information security people really care about doing meaningful security awareness training. This is something that I am really passionate about. Um, but then again, you need to have, um, you need to be high enough in a hierarchy to be able to implement something. So if you see a problem, and in the beginning I said that the service desk is junior and low in hierarchy. So if they do see problems, there are organizational issues that will stand in the way of actually fixing them in the way that the service desk people say, may, may see, see fit. Uh, except for side channeling, and side channeling is usually not very good. So this is the distribution of computer skills among people aged 16 to 65. This came, uh, this is an OECD report. And what you can see here is that in Scandinavia, where I come from, 7% of the people are considered um, having strong computer skills. And two thirds in the OECD have no computer skills or bad computer skills. Terrible or poor, that is. So in, in, uh, when I saw this in the beginning, I said, thought that, hey, okay, those people that can't use computers in Sweden, they must be over 65. And yeah, that's an issue. But it's at least not an issue in a co corporate environment. But this is between 16 and 65. So w we have had people who are working with computers for 20 years. The ones that were 40 when, uh, <coughs> when we started to roll out computers in corporate environments. And still, such a great number have no computer skills or really, really poor computer skills. So again, we need to do more security awareness training. We need to do more uh, computer training at all. And we need to stop looking down at our users. So some remedies. We have some problems with bad bosses uh, that may cause toxic environments. And like, how do you measure this? This is, this is obviously a problem because it can't be quantified in the way that, like a firewall, you can know that you have your firewall up or down, so it's one or zero. But how do you calculate that you have procedures that actually work? How do you change a culture that is already toxic? So the remedy here is good culture, and how do you do that? I don't know. Let's find out together, shall we? Uh, the pr problem about privilege, as I already said, is that you need procedures in order <coughs> to implement an actual and reasonable least privileged approach in a service desk environment. So passwords, yeah, we've been talking about this for three days, so and also, what's the solution? Let's crowdsource it together, shall we? Um, 
insiders, the problem is that you will give privilege to the wrong people, and how do you know that from the beginning, that a person is, uh, is going to leak things? Um, or you piss off the wrong people, and they have really high access, and before they go, before you, you can lock them out, uh, they destroy all, everything. And this is, this is obvious, no, there, there are other things that uh, can st may stand in the way of you actually doing that. Um, but, <laughs> you know, adrenaline will make your brain work very strangely. Uh, also, if you have no sense of belonging, for example, uh, if you are in an outsourced service desk, uh, you don't feel that you belong to the organization that you are supporting, and so it's easier to bribe you, for example. So <laughs> the solution here is basically be nice and don't have a toxic culture. And about the users, we have the problem that we have the cultural difference between those 5 to 7% who are strong in using computers, like the ones who are in service desk, or all of you, and all of the rest. So we need to, to do some kind of awareness training that actually works, and we need to design so that they don't <coughs> have to be that aware. That's it. Do you have any thoughts? <laughs>